She is the Population and Sustainability Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, um, which is a national nonprofit conservation organization, the website biologicaldiversity.org. Do I have all that right? I do, cool. So Stephanie, um, uh, let's start out with the, um, in fact, let's just define terms. What is biological diversity and why is it important? Well, you know, we recently had this report that came out talking about just how important biological diversity is um, from UN scientists where they identified that biological diversity is essentially, we're talking about wildlife and wild places, what's keeping our planet healthy and functional um, and frankly, a better place to live as well. And, you know, we recently saw this report from the from UN scientists that said that in the coming decades, we are going to see a million or more species go extinct, that we are in the midst of an extinction crisis. And they also talked about what that means for humans. I mean, that loss is incredible in itself, but they also talked about what that means for humans, how that affects the ecosystems that we rely on for things like clean water and clean air and food. Yeah, if, if people want a metaphor, uh, you know, the human body is a pretty reasonable one. You know, you, you can operate with only one kidney, right? But when both kidneys are gone, you're in trouble. You know, if you, if you, you lose your liver, you know, it's a, or lose half your liver and one of your kidneys and maybe one of your lungs. And, and, and you're in trouble. Yeah, right. and, then, and then your left leg goes. And then, you know, and, and it's like, at what point does the entire system just shut down and basically die? Um, because in biological systems like our human bodies or like any other complex biological system without all these interacting and interrelated pieces it just doesn't work how close are we to breakdowns of biological systems around the world well we've already seen a lot of the impacts i mean some of it we see through some of the climate impacts that dar was talking about earlier but we also see it in these unprecedented droughts um, those are ecosystems that have broken down we've seen it people often refer to the amazon as as the lungs of the planet and we've seen how much of the Amazon has has been destroyed, um, much of it for for agriculture, particularly animal agriculture. Um, you know, and so we're already seeing this breakdown where it's harder and harder for farmers to get the same yields out of crops. And a lot of that climate plays a, a part of that. Some of it is drought. Some of it is that we are destroying the health of soils. So we're already seeing that that playing out quite a bit. And you know, one of the really scary things is that we have no way of knowing as we're losing species exactly which ones are going to be the tipping point for a particular ecosystem because they rely on each other in such an, an intricate dance that makes this all work. And when we lose one, you know, we've seen a lot recently about uh, so many insects going extinct and so many people don't think about insects or have, you know, an, an innate aversion to insects, but we need insects. We need insects for pollination and for the health of ecosystems and to feed the other animals that people do often care about more leading up through birds and, and mammals and on up the chain. We had an absolutely shocking call into this program about a decade ago, and it led to this amazing conversation. This truck driver called in and he said, you know, I've been driving trucks here across the United States, coast to coast, for 30 years. And over the last five years or so, he said it used to be, particularly when I was driving through the South or the Midwest, that I'd have to stop every three or four hours to clean the bugs off the windshield during the peak, peak periods in summer. He said, I've driven most of the summer and I have not once cleaned the bugs off my windshield. And all these people started calling in from all over the country saying, I don't see the bugs anymore. I'm not seeing the bugs anymore. And then it was like, I'm not seeing birds anymore. And it's like, it, you, you, you engage people in these conversations and they go, yeah, you know, actually, now that I think about it, stuff is vanishing. Yeah, and some of us who grew up, you know, with with these amazing species that were part of our summer, like fireflies and monarch butterflies that used to be pretty ubiquitous across the United States, we're just not seeing them anymore. Their their numbers have plummeted so much. So how does this tie to, to humans consuming too many resources? How do we define overconsumption and how does that tie into what we're talking about in, this, in terms of this loss of biodiversity? Well, as you mentioned earlier, you know, right now we're using way more, way more resources than the planet can replenish in a year. Um, as you said, most people cite the number about one and a half times if everybody lived like we do in the U.S., um, we'd need five planets. We still only have one, so so that creates a problem. Um, but you know what we see is that every time every human on the planet requires a few basic needs, requires food, shelter, water, some form of energy for you know for heat, transportation, and that sort of thing. And every time, all of that takes resources from the planet. This is all resources that we are sharing with wildlife. And of course, in some places, particularly here in the U.S. 
we're using those resources particularly irresponsibly. Um, so we see it through, you know, the fossil fuel extraction um, and, and the use of fossil fuels and all the pollution that goes with it that not only affects human health, that also affects wildlife. Um, we see it through the impacts of climate change that are greatly altering habitats um, and, and changing, changing food chains for a lot of animals. Um, and we see it particularly through agriculture as well. Agriculture takes up a significant portion of the planet and it's responsible for really across the board of environmental metrics. It's it's the, one of the worst players. It's a massive amount of pesticide use, which directly affects those those bugs that we were talking about. Um, and we see land being destroyed, converted to these monocrops, or being used for pasture land, and that that gets rid of the habitat that animals from from those insects on up through carnivores need. And so every time that we are everything that we take from the planet for our own survival is taking it from wildlife. And we've really lost that balance where we're able to coexist with them. So uh, Robert Mueller came out this morning and said, basically, I'm not going to clear Donald Trump of anything, which reminds us how dysfunctional our political system is and, and how corrupt, essentially. I mean, we've got an entire administration, an entire political party, the Republicans, who literally will not acknowledge global climate change, much less overpopulation or resource depletion or, or things like that. At the level of policy, if we had sane policies around consumption, around the production of food, um, you know, uh, around the use of technology, how would those things change, in your opinion, if we, were, if we were looking at this in the context not of how do we make the Koch brothers another billion dollars uh, so that they can donate money to our party, or how do we, uh, you know, whatever, fill in the blanks. Instead of that, we were asking the question, what should our policies be to, to maintain the survivability of the human species on, species on Earth, you know, along with the biological diversity necessary to support our population? It would have to start with asking that question, is what actually matters for our survival and for the survival of wildlife, not starting with the question of how do we make the most money? So, you know, at the root of all is, you know, frankly, we need to disrupt capitalism because that whole idea that we can continue having infinite growth on a finite planet, it simply doesn't work. Um, you know, and, and we're seeing the impacts of that now, but because it's such a short-sighted system, they just continue passing the same policies. So we would need to start with looking at, you know, if you look at our food system, the farm bill is a mess. Um, it's subsidizing all the wrong things. It's perpetuating monocrop, this monocrop system um, that is, that's gearing towards feeding livestock rather than feeding people directly. And so we would need to start with some of these really big fundamental policies that we have, like the farm bill, and shifting, you know, shifting the, the subsidy so that it's actually supporting smaller to mid-sized farmers who are growing regionally appropriate foods that require less resources than what's currently being grown. Um, we would see a massive shift and an immediate shift, obviously, away from supporting fossil fuels and investing that all into renewable energy and really clean, local, democratized renewable energy, talking about things like community solar, not just saying, well, let's invest in, you know, in these massive infrastructures that will continue to destroy habitat, but thinking, how do we do this in the best possible way? Because it is possible. So what's the role of technology in all this? I mean, you mentioned solar power, for example, wind power, ways of, of you know, acquiring energy without burning fossil fuels. Um, and, and I think we're on the cusp of those power systems being able to generate enough power that they could run the blast furnaces necessary to make the steel for the blades for the turbines or to make the, the glass for the covers of the, you know, and the, and the rare earths and whatnot in the, in the solar panels. Um, we're kind of on the verge of this extraordinary, entirely renewable, entirely, you know, uh, system. Um, but what role does technology play in all this and how, do, how, do we, how should we think about it? When you look at something like renewable energy, like you said, we're, we're very close and there's way more that we could be doing than we currently are, um, especially if you start looking at how do we reduce energy waste so we don't have to produce as much energy because we waste a lot of energy in, in our buildings and in our systems that, are, um, you know, that aren't nearly as efficient as they could be, especially when you look at things like heating and electricity. And so I think you know, when we look at, at that balance of let's reduce waste so we don't have to produce so much more and then let's look at what that gap really is and it's fairly small, and the places where we need 
you know, any sort of technology advance are, are pretty targeted in areas like storage for solar energy. Um, you know, we need to upgrade the, our energy infrastructure, but that needs to happen anyways, frankly. But beyond that, you know, we still have so many people who are expecting technology to save us all that, well, we don't need to, to buy into solar. There's going to be something else that makes fossil fuels clean that will somehow produce more fossil fuels than Oh, they're than advertising on TV right now. I mean, right, you know. and there's and there's this idea of that that we don't have to change anything. We just have to wait for this technological miracle. But that's completely false because we already have the technology we need. We've made so many advances in renewable energy and solar in particular that we can start this transition, and we really have to start this transition off of fossil fuels now. When we look at um, agriculture, you see a lot of people talking about like, well, what are ways that we can kind of tweak the way that we do agriculture to to mitigate some of the effects? But we already know that certain Certain foods, like plant-based foods in particular, require far less resources than animal-based foods, and we can shift Go our vegan. diet. <laughs> right? Yeah. That plant-based diet is really such an important piece of this. And you know, and we've seen this from clients, uh, climate scientists too, who now are more and more starting to talk about food because they realize we are in such a crisis point that we can't just be talking about energy. We need to be talking about everything across all sectors and how we how we minimize our impact. And even talking about, you know, population issues, we already have excellent birth control. We have excellent repro reproductive health care that's available. We just have to commit to making it available. And that's really where, to go back to the policy question of where it needs to start, is not just our survival, but talking about that equity and that equality question. Because, you know, even here in the United States, when you talk about access to reproductive health care and contraception, we think, well, you know, we're fine because we're below replacement rate fertility, but nearly half of women in the United States, nearly half of all pregnancies in the United States are still unplanned. There are still major contraceptive deserts. So we need to really focus on the technologies and solutions that exist and make sure that we are getting them out to everybody. <laughs>